All right, this is show number 148 on June 16th. And tonight we have a special guest that's going to talk to us about something that I'm interested in, something I have not done yet, so I plan on learning something from uh, Greg tonight. Greg, how are you? Good. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Very good. Thank you. I'm having a heat wave down here in Atlanta. I think my truck said it was 100 degrees when I got in the truck to, uh, to come home oh tonight. Oh, my God. Yeah. Crazy hot like- down here. <laughs> but I'm in a nice air-conditioned basement, so all is well. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have those problems up in Minneapolis. <laughs> no. no I, I, well, I don't know. I don't. Sometimes it gets hot up there. But uh, we wanted to have you come on tonight. We've got a request from one of our listeners, Gordon. How do you say his last name? Ruff? Tim? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, we got, a, we got a request from Gordon who said, hey, you got to take a look at this guy's work. He's doing some great stuff with, with Luminosity. He's doing, uh, he's got this nice panel that, that you can install in Photoshop. Take a look at him. So I lo- went over and looked at Greg's stuff. Not only does he have that, but he has some amazing photos. You can see some of them streaming behind me right now. And we'll stream some of them during the show, too. He's got uh, all that. and he's gonna, So we're going to talk to a little bit about Greg, about what he does. And then we're going to come and he's going to do a little demo for us. So, Greg, uh, won't you tell us a little bit about how you got into photography? And, and also, is this a, uh, are you a full-time photographer or a hobbyist photographer or, or what? So I'm, I'm almost a full-time photographer on top of uh, having a full-time day job, right? So it's a passion uh, turned obsession, maybe. Uh, no, I've got a, I've got a full-time job, uh, market medical devices, actually. Um, but, uh, photography is something that I got into... Um, back in uh, 2000, uh, I lived over in London for about six months. And, you know, I was kind of like that, that Uber tourist trying to take photos of everything. Um, and, uh, you know, just after shooting a ton, I just finally got to a point. My buddy said, you know, hey, you got to get a real camera at a two megapixel uh, point and shoot back in the day. Um, and I went from digital back to film. It kind of pushed me into doing something more serious. And uh, next thing I know, it kind of uh, just rolled into something bigger and bigger. And, uh, Eventually, I started doing uh, professional work in about 2007 with like family portraits and weddings and that kind of stuff. But really, my my passion and where I spend most of my time is is around like landscapes and, and cityscapes. So that was kind of the the background. It just kind of took off from there. So they're saying my shirt looks like it's inside out. No, it's just faded, not inside out. <laughs> <laughs> faded. <laughs> Uh, so, Greg, does that does all, does that jo- does your job allow you to do a lot of traveling? Yeah, it, it does. You know, with with a marketing job, you know, I tend to be out, you know, going to conferences, meeting with customers, that kind of thing. Um, and so, a lot of times, I'll just try and tack on. You know, if I'm going out on a Friday or Monday, try and tack on the weekend or just add on some vacation or something like that. So that's that's helpful. Um, and I just tend to travel uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, my girlfriend and I, we don't have kids and. Um, you know, love to go kind of see the world. So my, my passion for, uh, travel and passion for photography really kind of go hand in hand. So that's awesome. That's an awesome opportunity to have a job that you can be paid to travel and, you know, and have actual work, but then have some time to, uh, you know, take some, take some photos and some amazing photos as I'm streaming them behind us. And we're now streaming them in chat too, in the, in the live stream. So yeah, you say you've been you've been to over seventy countries. I don't even think I can name seventy countries, but you've been to over. <laughs> yeah, 70, really. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been to over seventy countries, and uh, you know that could be a show in of itself, or or more than one show we, with you that where we could do a series of shows talking about that. So we, that's not the subject for tonight. But I did want to ask you, you know, looking back on all those, do any of them from a photographer standpoint? Or not, if you don't, if you have something else, do any of those stand out as like, wow, this was really a trip of a lifetime or for a photographer? Yeah. You know, I, 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 Mike, I tend not to take normal vacations. Um, you know, about the last three years I've been to, uh, Bhutan, which is a little country sandwich between China and India. And, uh, I've been to Cuba, you know, um, I was about just this short of actually going to North Korea, had it all figured out until we figured out that, uh, there's no heat in November. Um, and, uh, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't the right time to go. Um, so I end up in some pretty weird places, you know, so I, you know, I love to, you know, go to somewhere like, uh, you know, Italy, right. I, I mean, how could you ever get tired of a place like Italy, but I don't tend to go to museums and a lot of tourist destinations. I love to just go to a place, kind of soak up what it's all about. Um, so, 
you know, sometimes something catches me because it's just natural beauty like Iceland, which is amazing. Um, and sometimes it's just a really unique place um, like Bhutan, which has its own beauty, but um, it's just so unusual. So, I, I, you know, I'd say my favorite trips over the last, you know, call it 10 years, Iceland, um, Burma, uh, Cuba have really kind of stood out to me for, for different reasons. You know, Burma is just kind of untouched. Mm-hmm. Nobody, nobody goes there. Uh, Cuba street photography is incredible. I don't think, I don't think there's probably a, a place on earth that has, um, more friendly, more approachable people who are just unbelievably interesting. You know, every corner you go around in Cuba, people are hanging out, playing dominoes, chatting. There's something going on everywhere you go. Um, and so it's just a street photographer's dream. And it's all set against this, you know, facade of like, everything's kind of in, in ruins. And so obviously there's some really unique aspects of Cuba. Um, and then Iceland, which is just kind of raw beauty. And I actually went to Iceland before I was serious about photography. It was, you know, it was a while ago. So I'm, I'm dying to go back and, and really shoot it someday. So just so if everybody didn't catch, what is it you do again for a living? <laughs> and do they have any openings in, mar- in marketing for medical devices? Yeah. So, so none of those trips were related to work. That was all oh, okay. vacation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my, my coworkers call them my walkabouts. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, well, my short list of places I would love to go to that I'll probably never get to. Iceland's one of those. I would love to go there and, yeah. and spend some time. Iceland, Australia, Alaska's, man, that's doable. I can, I can go there someday. Um, those are my, and maybe Ireland, something like that are my top ones I'd love to go to. Among I think others, I'm right there with you on those. Yeah. Whatever reason, Iceland's like my number one I'd love to go to. I don't, I don't know if I've ever thought of Iceland and, uh, and it's not icy as opposed to Greenland, which is full of ice. I yeah, think well, it's I kind think, of backwards. I think Iceland still gets chilly. It's good marketing. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, I, I love just, you know, every place is its own kind of unique thing to me. I actually um, even went to Kosovo uh, a few years back. And you think, you know, why would you go to like these war torn countries? But um, it was incredible. And it's weird, right? We, um, my buddy and I went down there and you can't uh, you can't actually rent a car, at least as an American, and drive through all these different borders. Like you may be able to rent in Bosnia, but you're not going to take it over to, you know, Serbia and you're not going to go from Slovenia to, you know, whatever it's you can't do it. So we ended up, um, oddly enough, uh, leasing a car. You can do this with Peugeot. We got a basically a brand new car. I don't know how many miles were on the odometer. We leased it for three weeks. It cost pretty much the same as a rental. Um, and it was ours for three weeks and and drove it through like 23 countries. <laughs> so we we pulled up to Kosovo and uh, we had no plan at all. Like that's kind of my thing. I, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna like a place and I wanna stay for a week or get somewhere and think this is just terrible and keep moving. So I don't like booking hotels and I'll just kind of show up and figure it out. And I haven't had to sleep in a car yet. Um, so we, we got to Kosovo and, uh, because it's this, you know, temporary lease, it, it's got like a red license plate instead of the typical, you know, European white license plate. So it's a temporary plate. And so apparently in Kosovo, they have this issue with folks coming in, they drive a car in, sell it to avoid all the taxes kind of fly out. And so we got detained at the border. We're like, you know, stuck in customs for like a couple hours negotiating with these guys on, on, you know, why we want to come into Kosovo with our own car and how we're going to take it with us when, when we leave, <laughs> you know, cause they, they didn't know what to do with us. Cause I think they're used to like uh, K4, like the, uh, the military vehicles coming through and you get through the border and the speed limits in Kosovo are posted twice. There's one for cars and, and one for tanks. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's not a turnoff for you. Yeah, really. You don't get worried. No, you know, and it's funny. You, you go to these places and you hear these horror stories. We were going to Albania, right? And and uh, my buddy starts hearing all these stories. Kind of, oh, we knew this, this family and they just sneak their daughter out of the country in the trunk of a car because we're death threats against her and all this kind of stuff. I, you know, in all these places I've been, you know, I find people are friendly. You, you know, you're smart. It's no big deal. Um there was, there was nothing there that frightened me other than the roads. <laughs> the roads. And there are plenty of cars you see off in the ditch because they're like these windy mountain roads. Oh, okay. So, but, uh, yeah. 
All right. Well, you know, maybe someday we can have you back on and go over some of your travel photos or, or and talk more about travel photography because I'm sure with 70, 70 countries you have a lot of interesting photos and stories to, to talk about. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah. And staying off the beaten path was even better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going through your site, your website, and I, one, I love your gear page, your page where you list out all the gear and you have a little, a little something about each one. Maybe I can find it here for us, Tim. If I can get all this. There we go. You're not seeing it behind me, Greg, but you know what your your page looks like, right? Yeah. <laughs> of course, the so. first the first thing I noticed was the the drone. Yeah. And Tim and I both have a real cheap, like, what was it Tim like fifty buck drone? Yeah, fifty. The SEMA. It's a, the training one. It's the training, the training drone. You actually have the the one that I want the the Phantom Three. It's either that or else I was, I've been looking at a uh, the 3D robotics, but uh, trying to get that past uh, accounting is going to be a little bit of a <laughs> past <laughs> wife. Yes. <laughs> now, Just so, on the camera equipment. Here, well, here's the here's the question uh, that I have for that, and we won't spend a lot of time on it because we want to leave some time for the main event here. Do you find you know you go out and you spend on the on the DJI Phantom you're spending thirteen fifteen hundred dollars or maybe more if you get some of the, the the cases and extra batteries and all that kind of stuff. Do you find after you've owned it that you've used it and said you know what it was well worth the money I, I'm glad I got it. Oh yeah, you know so so I had like the forty dollar drone you know a couple months ago fly it around the living room kind of thing yeah. for, for probably the for, same one we have or something. I've yeah, tried it in the house. Maybe I can do that. I, I've tried mine in the house. um so so jumping up to the phantom 3 that was my first serious drone so you know this past month i've been flying all over the place just in kind of remote areas just get a a feel for it and kind of learn but you know i I already feel like it's worth it because to me um you know my goal is still photography i think the video is amazing i got the the pro version with 4k video i'll definitely be using that but for me there's all these you know shots um that i want to take where you just can't get in the right position and getting a camera up in the sky. It's, it's amazing um, what you can do. In fact, I don't, I don't know if I sent you uh, some of the drone photos or not. I could, I could pull one or two up, but um, I've been shooting around town a little bit and I'm just, I'm blown away at the quality, even for, uh, for night exposures. I was shooting the other night. There was uh, actually a little bit of wind and I was taking two second exposures and you definitely get some that are blurry, but, um, I got enough coming out that um, I got some really nice 12 megapixel images I could blow up. Uh, wait, a, two, wow. a two second exposure from a drone hovering in the air? Yeah. And it's like you said, some of them are blurry, but some of them came, actually came out. Yeah, it looks looks great. Um, I've been reading on the so you can on the uh, on the DJI Phantom. Um, it's a, a an f 2.8 lens. So you're either going to be shooting kind of nighttime or you could, you know, put like a neutral density filter on it. Um, but it'll let you manually go up to an eight second exposure. And I've been reading the forums. People say they're getting sharp images at eight seconds. I haven't wow. done that yet. I think you need a still night, but you know, that thing is um, incredibly stable, you know, with the GPS locked on, you know, if I set it here, it's just going to stay here and it kind of floats around in like a, maybe a, like a one foot little bubble. Um, so you've got that stability and then you figure you're shooting kind of a wide angle from a distance. So mm-hmm. it can tolerate a little bit of shake and the image will be fine. Um, so no, I'd, I'd have no problem taking the image I took, um, that was two seconds long and, and blowing that up. Oh, see, so, yeah, we would I, love to see so you. You're really going to talk me into buying one. <laughs> and, and <laughs> Tim and I have been talking that we want to do a whole show on drone photography. So that's, that's another topic for, for later on that. Cause I haven't got mine out yet, to be honest. I just charged it up this past weekend and it was a busy time of year for me. So I haven't got mine out, but I'm I'm hoping I get hooked on it like you are. So I take it out and get hooked on it and want to buy that that bigger one. It's completely addictive. Yeah. You know, it's it's fun to fly, and then it's kind of it's the camera you can put. You know, I wouldn't say anywhere because of you know regulations, but sure. um, you know, you you definitely can. You know, in an in an age when kind of people have kind of done everything, shot everything, you know, being able to put a you know camera up in the sky, you can take some really original photos that way. Yeah. So one of the things as I was looking through your through the list, and you mentioned it just now, is is ND filters, and uh, you you have uh, some ND filters. I have some ND filters, but I don't use them that often, and I don't know how many how many of our listeners actually use them. Right? Some of them may not even know what use they are. 
Can you spend a, a minute or two on when you use an ND filter and, and why? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a few different ways people use them. Um, for me, it's kind of about two things. Um, usually, um, so if, you, if, if people don't know what an ND filter is, right, neutral density um, basically is like putting sunglasses on your camera. It's just a dark lens. Um, you know, they make some of them are like graduated where it kind of goes from really dark to clear, you know, that sort of thing. I just get ones that are, you know, circular polarizer looking thing. You just kind of screw it in. It, you know, kind of blacks out most of what you see in the viewfinder, but it's, it's reducing the amount of light coming into the camera, which lets me shoot long exposures. So for example, um, I just got back from a, a trip to Japan and I was shooting midday and I wanted to do long exposure for like five minutes and I would just screw on two different ND filters and I could shoot, you know, for, um, a good five to 10 minutes at F eight in the middle of the day because of it. And so I've got these images where the water, the clouds, everything just kind of blurs out. And that means the architecture just looks really crisp and interesting in a way you can't normally shoot. So you see, I think you see a lot of this with uh, black and white and that's usually because with, you know, by the time you double stack ND filters, they do make kind of a color cast. Mm -hmm. um, I'm using Hoya filters. I, I really like them, but they make the image a little brown. So with one of them, I'm okay. With two, I would usually convert to, to black and white. Um, so that's, that's the first thing I want to use them for is just really long exposures, make water smooth, make the cloud smooth, get rid of people, cars, whatever. Um, the other thing I do is um, when people want to get, you know, like a longer exposure, a lot of times they'll, um, you know, go down to like F16, F22, something like that. And you're, you're really taking the lens beyond the sweet spot. You know, usually around F8, the lens will be, you know, maximum sharpness, which is different from depth of field, but usually you don't need that much depth of field. And I don't like going down to F22 or F16 because one, I'm going to get dust bunnies all yeah. over the shot. And I'm going to spend like my entire night retouching one image. Uh, and two, because of that softening effect, I'm kind of, you know, ruining the point of having a 36 megapixel D800 if I don't, you know, get all the value out of those pixels. So if I throw that filter on, I can shoot at F8 where the lens is giving me the maximum detail in the image and still get that long shutter without having to jump up to say F22 and have all those other problems. Right. Okay. Yeah, very good. I, I actually think that like that idea of using it just to get to the F8. I wouldn't even have thought of that. I mean, obviously, I, I, I've used used the neutral density. Probably it's been a while. But to get it for uh, – to slow down and, and actually use it for a split where you want to get the mountains seen, but the sky was too bright, so you wanted to stop that down so you had the mountain bright, or to slow it down to get the uh, the water movement. But never thought about it to get it to the F8. That's actually a, a great, great idea for it. And, and what um, speeds do you have or what um, stops do you have? I think I just have one, which is a, a two-stop neutral density. Which ones would you recommend you know, somebody getting? So, um, so I've got Nikon Pro Glass, and it's pretty much all the um, – I can't remember if it's 72 or 77 millimeters, but they're all basically the same size. So okay. that's pretty important because otherwise you would, if you're doing threaded filters, you need a different size for every lens or adapters. Um, but I've got a couple of Hoya. I've got the, the 1.8, which means it's a six stop um, reduction. And then I've got the three, which is a 10 stop. So if I stack them together, I've got 16 stops. Uh, and then I'll tend to bring a circular polarizer with me because that's going to be about a two and a half stop reduction as well. Um, and so I've got some kind of room to play with it. Because sometimes the problem is I throw the ND filter on and you know it's almost like too much and you want something kind of in the middle. So I like to have a few different options. Uh, the other way some people go, and I haven't done this yet, but I, I'd like to, is to get um, like the drop-in filters, right. you know, where you have like the big, you know, rectangle right, right, right. plastic kind of thing. And um, there's one called the, the Lee Big Stopper that, you know, I um, I picked it up. I haven't really used it yet. It's the kind of thing that, you know, on B&H, you got to wait about six months to get it. It's so popular. <laughs> it's never in stock. Um, but those are, are pretty nice. And one thing that's nice about that is you can lift it up so you can see through the camera to focus and compose and then oh. drop it down. When I do the screw on, the problem is, you know, if I need to refocus or recompose, you know, with one filter, I can kind of crank up the live view and, and get away with it sometimes. But a lot of times I might have to take it off and recompose. And right. uh, that's just not fun. Yeah, I was just going to say at 16 stops, I mean, you don't see anything. 
No, no, not, not a, not a thing. You know, with, with just one of them, you know, if you open up the aperture and you crank it up to high ISO in the live view, um, you can see enough to, to focus and compose. I mean, it's going to be grainy, but with two of them, it's just black. Right. So yeah. So dr the drop in type probably would be better if you're going to do it that way. Yeah. I, I think I need to get comfortable with it. I just haven't done it. Now is a drop in, is a drop in kind cheaper than the other kind or is it, um, uh, same, same cost? You know, I think they're kind of ballpark pretty similar. Depends, I guess, on which one you get and what quality. But you know, the ones the ones that I've you know looked at are all kind of in that call it like eighty to two hundred dollar range. So they're not cheap. Hmm. Um, but I wonder if that I, might be a good option if somebody has lenses with different size lens lens mount mounts. Can't they use that system with different size lens mounts? Or screw yeah, screw yeah. Yeah, you could you could step down a threaded one, but the the drop in I think is a little bit easier. So you get like a Koken holder or like a Lee holder, and you get like different adapters for your different lenses. So that's you know a pretty pretty simple way to go. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about luminosity masking. I have not actually ever done this, so this is going to be really really interesting to me. And my first question is, how is this different from just doing uh, either HDR or just in in Lightroom? playing with the highlight and shadow sliders. Yeah. Well, I, there's definitely areas of overlap. You know, some of the things I do with, you know, luminosity mass, I could do with other techniques and, and I may just like the result I get better. Sometimes it's something I just couldn't do. Um, so the, the basic idea with the luminosity mask. So when you think about when you do layers in Photoshop or you can add masks that control how much of that layer shows through to the next layer. And so it, traditionally, with a, you know, a lot of the tools that are built into Photoshop, when you select something, it's usually kind of an all or nothing deal, right? If I use the, the magic wand to select the sky, I'm going to have, you know, the entire sky selected 100% with a hard edge. And if I try and, you know, darken that down now, you're going to have these really obvious edges where you've, you've retouched it, right? So there's no subtlety at all. The idea with a luminosity mask is, you're using the, the luminance or the, the brightness of the image to create the mask. And so what you can do is, you know, say basically, I wanna create a mask that's based on the brightest parts of the image, you know, which is the sky, and it's gonna sort of naturally, you know, feather or taper from that point down. So let's say I've got a, a mountain and a sky, you know, the sky might be fully selected and the mountains is a little bit selected and maybe the foreground and the shadows is just, you know, black in the mask. And, and I can show this in the demo, but when you do that, you basically have this subtlety so that when you make an adjustment, um, the results look really natural. So, you know, if I was going to use like highlights and, and shadows in say Lightroom, I just have one control for highlights and shadows, but maybe I want to just, you know, work on the brightest spot of the sun, or maybe I want to work on the whole sky. And, you know, with the controls you have in like camera raw or Lightroom, you don't have that ability to kind of flex the tool and, and make it what you want it to be. You're kind of working on everything. Um, so those are great tools, but if you want a little more control, you can use, you know, kind of a highlights mask. Um, and then you can do things like select mid -tones. So there's no adjustment in Photoshop to say, you know, if you think about like an Ansel Adams, you know, yeah. zone system, 10 zones, I want, you know, zone five or some kind of skin tone or something like that. And I just want to work in that zone. There's no way to really do that with luminosity masks, though. You can work in that zone and have that nice subtlety to it. So the, the key advantage, I'd say, is just having a more realistic result um, than what you get from other tools. Yeah, and that definitely I see that in these images. That When I put up the images, I'm thinking, good God, these are just gorgeous. And you, none of them look like HDR to me. I mean, they look, you, there's a lot of detail in, in the image, but none of them have that HDR look, which I right, guess. Right, that is, phony cartoonish almost look when it's over, over done with the HDR. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you look at like the, um, I'm forgetting, what's the name for the kind of the top images on 500px, um, the flow or whatever it's called. Uh, but if you look at the top images there, right, you see the stream. It's like every other image is either some like amazing mountain or some girl in a bikini, right? But the you know, if, you, if you look at all the mountain shots, um, you know, a lot of them, once you get used to the idea of luminosity masking, you can tell a lot of them were edited with luminosity masks. They don't have kind of the telltale characteristics of an HDR. 
but they're clearly, you know, not something right out of the camera. And you can, you, you start to kind of spot some things that you realize, you know, chances are that was done, you know, using luminosity masks. And usually it's kind of part of a toolkit. You know, I don't usually just use luminosity masks. You know, I do it with other things, sometimes with HDR, sometimes with, you know, Nick plugins, sometimes just other manual things in Photoshop. So to me, it's kind of like one more ingredient in the, in the dish, if you will. So, so how long have you been uh, using luminosity mask? Um, I got turned on to it a couple of years ago. Uh, a photographer named Scott Cublin um, mentioned him to me and kind of started checking it out and kind of slowly um, started going down that path. And, you know, I say slowly because I was, I was pretty frustrated with it. Um, the, the, the way that I think most people do luminosity masks is by using uh, channels in Photoshop. And so what happens is that there's no tool to just create a luminosity mask. You basically, you know, create uh, like an RGB channel mask, and then you have to sort of multiply, add and subtract it to itself to get these different selections. And you start kind of jumping through a lot of different hoops to get to the final results. And you can write actions in Photoshop to automate that process and generate these masks. But once you do that, you're then kind of jumping back and forth to the channels panel. And, you know, that's taking up more screen space and your files get really big if you don't remember to delete them. And I just didn't like the workflow. So it wasn't really working for me. Uh, and I didn't use it that much. But I finally got to a point where I said, you know, all right, there's got to be another way to get kind of this result without the pain. And that, that was what kind of pushed me down the path of creating Lumencia, um, which um, I released back in February. Um, but I created, you know, last year, a long time ago, and I've been playing with for a while. And that's, that's when I really started to get pretty serious. So really probably about a year of pretty seriously working with them. Okay. And I got, how do you pronounce that? Lumenzia? Lumenzia. Lumenzia. I got that pulled up. So you, how, did you write this? Uh, are you a software engineer on the side too? <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i did so i uh um so i i learned uh javascript uh, html5 and and css so um basically uh you know, with older versions of photoshop with cs6 there's actually a tool that adobe's created um called configurator that'll help you create panels and you can you can do some pretty basic things without knowing any coding um, when you get into the newer versions of uh, Photoshop, you need to be able to, you know, write in HTML and CSS, which is basically the code that, you know, is behind any website out there. And JavaScript is kind of what makes, you know, websites interactive. Uh, and that's the same kind of thing in Photoshop. So you can write a, a macro or an action, um, but you can't get very far with that. You know, when you write those macros, they can't be very responsive. They can't do any you know, computations that can't help you deal with any errors. Um, so I did try and write something with uh, actions a while ago and it just wasn't working for what I wanted to do. Um, so I wrote the whole thing in, in JavaScript. It's basically programming language. And so it, you know, the idea is that it can help you analyze the image, work through it, keep things simple and organized. So there's a lot of complexity under the hood. Lumenzia is actually about like, uh, a little over, I think, 4,000 lines of code. So there's there's kind of a lot going on behind the scenes, but the, the goal is to try and take that complexity away so things are as simple as possible for the user. So one day you woke up and decided, you know what, I'm going <laughs> to learn Java and then write a 4,000 line uh, piece of code to help me out with my luminosity masking. Yeah, I'm kind of stubborn that way <laughs> and, and you and i guess along the lines you also said to your girlfriend i'll see you next year <laughs> as i'm yeah, committed to this. to this yeah yeah <laughs> so <laughs> I, i've got it pulled up now where and i think tim you put the link in there or is this something uh that i can get that the average person can get and if i can uh what's what are you selling it for so if you go on my website you know i, I my goal is that is to help other photographers um, you know, so, I mean, obviously I'm trying to, you know, sell Lumenzia and try and, you know, compensate for some of the time I've put into it over the last yeah. year. And I probably, uh, you know, would have done better working at McDonald's for all that time. But, yeah. <laughs> um, so I've got, I've got a couple options on my website. I've got, first, there's a bunch of free tutorials on YouTube and my website to kind of talk through how you would do luminosity masking. 
Um, but then I've got these free actions. So you can use the actions. Um, I haven't tested older versions of Photoshop, but I'm, I believe, uh, I know at least to CS4 because people tell me it works. And I think even CS2 with the actions, you can use that. And then I've got a panel um, that's also free. So my website, um, you know, if you sign up for the newsletter, you get a link to, to download the, uh, the free action. So with the panel, it basically lets you create kind of those uh, call it traditional um, channel based masks. So it'll spit out a, a preset list of uh, luminosity masks. So um, if you, you know, if it's not in the budget or you're just trying to play with it, that's uh, that's one option. Uh, Lumenzia uh, is a paid option. So uh, it's 40 bucks. And you just, you know, go to the website and there's a link there to, to buy it right from my site. Yeah, I see. And that's definitely a, a very reasonable price. $39.99, 40 bucks for that. And I think Gordon, who's out there in chat, who who connected us with you, uh, he is a fan of this. He has tried out uh, several others and, and says this is by far the best one he's tried. Well, thanks, Gordon. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so... All right, could you uh, do us a little demo on how to to do this? Are you ready for that, or you want to? Yeah, let me uh, see if I get my desktop going here. Let me know if. Uh, and are you are you wanting to do one with without Lumenzia and then one with, or you want to do one just with it? Um. Yeah, we can kind of do both, um, or at least I can kind of pull up the the free actions, kind of show what that looks like. Um, I won't stray too far from some of the basic stuff. So I'll, I'll kind of speak to when things are common or when they aren't. Okay. Can you guys uh, see my screen? Okay. I can. And if you're watching us, I need to lock it in on you because as we make noise, it'll go off of you. If anybody's watching live, you may, if you're not watching us on the highest resolution, you may want to switch to that. If not, you can get the recorded version and, uh, where I record in 1080p actually, and you'll get even better. Okay. So I'm just pulling up this uh, image. So I, I mentioned I just went to, uh, to Japan. This is the uh, Fushimi Inara Shrine. Um, uh, it's in Kyoto. It's this incredible place, kind of a you know small hill or mountain um, with literally just thousands of these orange gates around the trails. Some parts are really dense like this. Other parts, they're just big and more spaced out. But it's just unbelievable. Um, and you walk around this thing and, and apparently these are made out of wood and they're just continuously painting them. So I guess they last for about six years. Um, and they, so they just keep painting in cycles. Yeah. So they paint them and they put the writing on it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So they've what, got to... Any idea what the writing says? Cause it looks like it's different on each one. <laughs> you know, it's, it, I, it might be just Japanese graffiti. I think this is like <laughs> a couple name, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um so what i uh, what i pulled up here is a demo of how you could do what's called uh, exposure blending um so with luminosity masks you can use them just with a single image uh as a way of tweaking that image or you can use them uh for exposure blending which is essentially like the manual version of hdr right so hdr would automatically combine a bunch of Im images and then you kind of, you know, set a few sliders and it spits out an image that helps you get over, you know, limitations in terms of the camera can't capture the full dynamic range of the scene. The, uh, with exposure blending, you're doing the same thing, but you're fully in control. So a scene like this, uh, this lantern is kind of blown out. So this is kind of call it my normal exposure, but the, uh, the lantern and the, the orange around it is just too bright. And I couldn't bring that all the way back in, you know, in, uh, in Lightroom. So uh, it's just, it just blown out. So if I take another exposure, so here's the, the next darkest exposure. This is one stop darker. I just kind of layered these here. You can see, you know, going from blown out to a little bit better in the lantern. Obviously, the background is starting to become kind of boring and too dark. And then here's yet yeah, one stop darker and the lantern looks pretty good. So the idea here is to use luminosity masks to blend you know two or three of these images together so that i can keep you know the orange gates here that look great but then uh you know bring in this lantern um you know which you know looks awesome is obviously the focal piece of the image but it's just kind of blown out here so the the first thing we got to do is um these are obviously not uh, fully aligned so I'm yeah just gonna... you took these on a tripod though right 
You know, I did. There were a lot of people moving around. It took me a long time to get a clean shot. So I probably was bumping the tripod a little bit. I, usually I find my images are, like, you know, don't really need alignment. But, um, you know, I think there was like a security guy or someone came by me when I was shooting this. So I kind of bumped it. Yeah, because they look like they're really close, just a little bit off. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can see the white edge here now that they're aligned. It's kind of a, a few pixels off. So that's, you know, obviously uh, key number one is make sure you align them. Otherwise, when you start to blend it, you know, it's going to look terrible. I think it'll get kind of blurry and funky. Right. So, um, so I've got, I've got them aligned and I've got just that base image turned on here. So we need to, to create the luminosity mask first. So, um, if I go and, um, pull up my, uh, you know, these are my, the free actions you download from my website and, uh, inside that there's basically two options. There's to create the masks and then delete the masks. And if I run this, what'll happen is in the channels, it's going to create all these different masks from this original, you know, data here. So if I run this, you know, it takes just a couple of seconds and it's going to spit out these different channel masks. So none of these are in use in the image. It is taking up space, you know, so the image went from uh, 200 megs, to two gigs, <laughs> obviously a lot of, a lot going on there. And that's why you'd want to uh, use delete the delete them. function when you're done and that'll just wipe them out. So you can, you know, recreate them whenever you, you need them here. But so once you've got these masks, you can then kind of cycle through them here and find the one you want. So if I wanted to work on this lantern and kind of, you know, brush in uh, the lantern from one of the dark exposures, and I want something that is selective to the lantern and the detail around it and doesn't select the other pieces. So with a, uh, with a mask of any type, you know, um, white is, is selected and, and black, uh, is not. So they'd say, you know, white reveals and black conceals. And so, um, if this was, you know, something I did with the, uh, you know, some of the, some of the traditional Photoshop tools, I'd see just kind of like a white block here. And then the stuff around it would be black or something like that. Right. Whereas you can see in this here, you know, the lantern is, is highly selected and then the wood gets less selected. And then these pillars in the foreground are almost black and the, the black parted, you know, down below is, is completely dark. So if I use this as a mask for an adjustment, it's going to adjust most parts of the image, but it's going to adjust this part more than this part. And this part will hardly be touched at all. So this uh, for blending is not a great mask because it is going to, Kind of adjust everything so i can step down and figure out what's you know what's a little better well lights two is essentially um you know also selecting the light parts of the image but it's more restricted to just the brightest parts and you can kind of cycle down these until you're getting really selective to just the the brightest parts of the image so looking through these you know something like lights three maybe lights four is going to be the mask that i want to use to paint in uh, this image. When I find the, the one that I want, um, you can just kind of basically hit uh, this option down here to load as a selection. Um, and you can see the marching ants and you see them kind of in the detail here because uh, anything that's more than 50% selected gets you know marching ants around it. Uh, and that's just telling me what's selected. So now that I've got that selected, I would just simply click back onto the RGB. So I'm, I'm looking at the image. I'm not looking at the channel, but uh, I have that, that channel mask loaded as a selection. All right. um, and so at that point, I can start making adjustments to the image. So for example, if I just simply wanted to load this up as a, a mask here, I can click to load it as a mask and it takes that selection and applies it. So you can see you know, if I alt click on the mask here, this is exactly what that channel mask looked like. So, you know, whereas before, you know, none of these channels were, were doing anything. Now that I've loaded it up on a layer, this layer is doing something and it's, it's pretty subtle, but if you look at the, uh, the detail here, you know, you can see that this lantern yeah. is actually getting a lot better. Um, and then I could go in and kind of do the same thing on this next layer. So that was, you know, the lights three, I could jump over to like the, the lights four 
or even the five, let's say, let's try the five. I don't know what's going to work here. I usually, it's a little bit of trial and error sometimes. Um, so I'm just going to load that as a selection and then go back and I'm just going to apply it to this top layer. And so now you, know, you can see that the metal detail in this lantern mm -hmm. has come back in, you know, and even like some of these little highlights that were a little bit blown out are fixed. So if we look at the original image, you know, this lantern was losing a lot of detail and now we've brought it back in by manually blending these layers. And if I was going to do this for a finished image, I'd probably spend a little bit of time and I might brush down some of the effect here. Uh, you know, it's maybe a little bit to my taste overdone right in there. Yeah. You know, I could bring some of that detail back and you can do that by just, um, you can paint right on these masks. So if I load up the, uh, the paintbrush tool, and I've got black paint selected here and I like to kind of turn down the, the flow. So things, you know, stay fairly, uh, fairly subtle, but I could just paint black on this to kind of darken out this, uh, this mask. And that's basically making a change in the image. So I'm going to undo that and just kind of show live. So I'm still selecting the, uh, the mask here. Yeah. And as I paint, I'm reducing the uh, the effect that was applied there. So if I kind of do a before and after. Oh yeah, you know, what do you see it there? I see it there. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and so now now the mask you know has that luminosity mask, but I basically ripped out this chunk of the mask, you know, and you know by painting with a soft edge brush, the edges here are kind of smooth, and there's a you know there's a really natural transition, and that's the the beauty of the luminosity mask is basically you know, this is fully selected and this is less. And you know, that subtlety is why, you know, the finished image doesn't look like it was Photoshopped, even though obviously we, we did a lot to it. And if you think about, uh, you know, if I had done this as, you know, as an HDR, um, I might get this lantern looking pretty good, but my guess is the orange pillars would have some pretty weird looking artifacts. Um, I still do a lot of HDR, but usually when, all the details are kind of intermingled. Um, when I have like big chunks, like a big sky or just like one piece of the image like this, that to me is perfect for luminosity mass where I can do these really targeted adjustments. If I'm looking at a cityscape and the details intermingle, sometimes, you know, HDR works great. And sometimes I use luminosity mass. It depends, but um, you know, this result here just looks to me a lot better. And we haven't even started adjusting the underlying image. I, I'd take this, and you know, do some additional adjustments in Nick or other things like that to finish it. Um, but you kind of you get a sense for how it gave us a, a much better starting point there. Yeah. Um, does that that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. It's, I, I like seeing it in action. And for a while there, I wasn't knowing where you're going, but yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well, and so so you're asking about the difference between you know the the free actions and, and Lumenzia. So. Um, let's just kind of wipe this out and go, well, I'll just go back to the, uh, the original starting point on this image. So one thing to note is you see that there's like a gazillion history states here. Right. And I'm only saving 50 history states the way I've got Photoshop <laughs> set up. So there's all sorts of stuff before this that's not even shown. Um, you know, for example, when I actually uh, create the, uh, the masks, if you look at the history that it generates, it's something like I don't know, about 50 different uh, states that it create, creates to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's, you know, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So, okay. Um, so go back to the original. So um, there's no, uh, there's no channels in here now. Uh, we don't need to use the channels uh, panel at all. So I'll just kind of close that, um, you know, with Lumenzia and uh, we're back to kind of a, a zero state on the history. So, um, Actually, I shouldn't have done that because we needed we needed those layers. Let's see if there's. Uh, I'm actually going to do this a different way because I want to keep these uh, layers up. Re uh, redoing everything. I know what I'm doing when we're done with this show. <laughs> I'm, I'm downloading several things from your site, <laughs> <laughs> and and I don't know if I'm going to do it tonight, but uh, soon I'm going to buy Lumenzia. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, so here we're kind of back to that starting point. We've got these layers that are aligned. Uh, all the channels are gone. Uh, there's no masks on this. So, um, you know, this is where we started with the, uh, the free actions. So in Lumenzia, um, you know, my goal is simplification. And I know when you look at this panel, you kind of think, well, that doesn't necessarily look <laughs> a lot of buttons. There's a lot of buttons. <laughs> 
Um, but it, there, there's actually a little bit of uh, kind of rhyme and reason to it. And, and you know, give me a second to maybe explain that. Hopefully sure. uh, it'll make more sense. Um, so, you know, with, with Lumenzia, if you want to select the light stuff, it, you know, this L, you know, L2, L3, et cetera, these are exactly the same selections. You know, if I hit L2 here, and what I'm looking at is exactly the same thing I would have had uh, if I used the uh, the L2 channel that I created uh, from the free actions. You know, same thing with you know lights five. These are all the exact okay. Same. That makes sense. But the the thing is, you know, I don't have to jump over to the channels palette to to look at it. I can just flip back and forth, and when I'm clicking on them, you know, all these steps, it's just generating one little history state. So if I go and say, all right, I want to look at a, a dark mask then it generates one history state. And if I don't like it, I can just hit, you know, control Z or command Z and undo it. Cause it's one state. Wow. Um, whereas if it was the actions, you know, kind of, it's kind of good luck finding it in, in all that uh, mess, you know, so really easy to track what happened here. Um, so basically um, I can hit X and I'm just going to get rid of the, the preview. I can just go um, and just click through the different masks to find the one I want. So I can go down and say, all right, you know, the lights three mask looks like the one I want, but if I need different masks, I've got, you know, the lights going from loosely selected to, you know, highly specific to the lights. And then I've got kind of light mid So These are a little bit darker shades of gray, you know, so here I don't have the, the shadows selected and I don't have the highlights selected. I've got the brighter highlights, you know, which is close to the lamp. And when I, you know, go down to the next level, these are the mid tones. So this is basically everything but the highlights and the shadows. And then I get the dark midtones. So this is going to be, you know, midtones, but not the ones that were bright close to the lamp. Um, and I can go all the way down to the darks, which is, you know, basically everything that wasn't light. So if I go down to a more specific darks mask, now I've got, you know, the black parts of the image selected because those are the darkest parts of the image. So you can basically, with this upper panel here, determine, do I want to pick something that's kind of a light tone or a dark tone or anything in between, and how specific do I want it to be? Uh, or I've got these zone masks here. So the idea is I can say I want zone zero or one or two, or yeah, I can kind of step through, you know, zone 10 is going to be the highlights here. So you can, you know, really pick anything you want and you can just step through by clicking on these various previews, but uh, okay. So you know, a couple couple questions. Yeah, so you got the I understand the D, the M, and the L. So you're the dark, the midtones, and the lights, and you got five zones or so between each one of those. And then you got your ten zones or eleven zones um, below that, going from the lights to the darks, right? Yep. So with, with, if I choose the, the D or the M or the L, in total I have 15 zones there, right? Or if I choose the 0 to the 10, I'm basically working in about 10, uh, 11 zones. Yep. Okay. And then what are the – they had some buttons in between, like the DM1, DM2, LM1, LM2. What, what are those? So, so the idea here is this is, you know, lights. These are midtones. These are light midtones. Okay. And these are dark midtones. Ah. So, so basically, you know, the, the background here showing the different, you know, brightness values is there. You go. Like, I didn't even notice that. Guide. <laughs> you know, that that's kind of the you know, the idea behind that. So let me let me pull up a, a different way of looking at it here. So this is um, a test chart that I've used. So um, here we just have a gradient going from pure black to uh, pure white. Yeah. You know, so if I go and say, all right, I want lights five then I'm getting a selection of the brightest stuff and it tapers off pretty quickly as opposed to like a lights, which is going to be the light stuff, but it takes a long time to taper off. So if I take, um, you know, lights versus like light midtones, you know, you can see that it's, you know, the lighter end of the midtone spectrum right. versus, you know, the midtones are truly the center of the, the range or the dark midtones are the, uh, the dark range. And obviously the, uh, Darks are all the way at the, the far left there, um, you know, and, and same kind of thing with the zone mask. You're going from darkest to lightest. So, you know, zone zero is all the way over. The darkest, so zone yeah. one. You know, you kind of step through these and you can kind of see that. That is cool. Know, relative to the under underlying image, you know, you're just getting 
different selections. So you can really hone in on whatever it is you need there. And you know, one of the thoughts I had around this is, you know, the, the, with the zone masks, if you're selecting something in the middle, you don't really necessarily know, you know, what it is you're trying to uh, to select. Like, is that a zone seven or is it a zone four? I, right. know, I don't know. Um, so let's say this is our image here. These uh, these color charts are basically from kind of dark to light and from fully saturated to not saturated for the various colors. So let's say I wanted to figure out, you know, what is kind of this part of the, the blue range? Mm-hmm. Well, I can use this little plus symbols here that are uh, what I call the zone picker. Okay. And I should have explained this A through uh, E. So, so, so the zero through 10 are these targeted zones. So zone five, you know, is this part of these <laughs> colors in, in the middle of that gradient. It's um, like an x-ray, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that dude on the right. Somebody's broken. <laughs> that dude on the right has got some problems. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, zone five is pretty specific to the middle. Yeah. Zone C is essentially centered in the middle, but it's less specific. So I click that and you can see it kind of uh, got yeah. more broad. Right. So, so A through E is basically, you know, the zone system, but instead of being 10 stops like Ansel Adams, I do it in five. Okay. So it just gives you a little bit more kind of flexibility. Oh, wait, Ansel Adams had 10 zones? Well, I guess 11, right? I was going to say, I was, I was going to give you credit for having 11 and having yeah. beaten him. But, <laughs> but if, if, he, if he has 11, then I guess it's a tie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you can't, you cannot do Ansel. Yeah. Um, Okay, but, sorry to uh, interrupt. You were about to talk about the pluses or whatever. Yeah, so so with the zone picker, the idea is, you know, if I want to hit this part of the curve, I have no idea. I mean, I know it's probably not a one or a nine, but I really don't know where it is. I can just click on this, and it brings up this little dialogue, and I just basically say, all right, I want that value, and I just say, okay, and it's automatically going to create a mask for me based on that value. So um, that happened to be zone five, um, okay. And it makes that selection for me. So you, you really don't have to, it, t- it kind of takes the guesswork out of it for you. Yeah. Um, so. All right. Yeah, uh, that's, that's good. And then so I guess yeah. the, the plus above it is for the A, B, C, D. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So if I pick this one, it would be the same selection, but it would just be more kind of loose, you know, wider zone. Okay. Um, so you know, so all, this whole top area, right, is all about creating a preview of the mask, but then you need to do something with it. And that's where this row of orange buttons comes into play. So you can load it up as a selection, which if you want to paint on a mask, then that's a great way to go. Um, but these other options basically, you know, load adjustment layers with a mask for you. Um, so... Okay. I'm just going to hide these colors again. It's kind of a little crazy. Yeah. So let's say we wanted uh, to work on, you know, lights three and I want to make an adjustment through a curve. Well, if I click the curve here, it's just loaded a, you know, a kind of a blank curve, no adjustment with that lights three mask. Right. So yeah. kind of starting yeah. from scratch there, right? So instead of having to create all the channels, flip the channels palette, find the one I want, load up as a selection, create, you know, curves adjustment. I can just click, click, and I've got that loaded up and I'm ready to start working. And so now if I take this and make an adjustment on this curve, you know, you can see that it's basically, you know, it's working on, you know, the, the lighter parts of, uh, of this image and maybe a better uh, example would be to simply just darken this thing down with this curve. Yeah. Yeah. There you, you know, go. It's, it's, you know, primarily yeah. working on the highlights there. Right. Um, so that, that's how you kind of transition from a preview to loading as a curve or a hue and saturation layer or a photo filter. Um, and if you want to load something else, you, you can. So I could say, for example, um, I'm going to just get rid of my, uh, my layer here. Um, so let's say I've got a lights three, but I want to load it up onto a color balance layer. All I got to do is load it as a selection and then just uh, go find the uh, color balance. That selection gets loaded. So now I've got a color balance layer with that. And, you know, that might be something I want to do if, uh, say, for example, I've got uh, a field of grass and I want to adjust, you know, the, the grass, but not the, uh, the shadows under the trees or something. So I can pick the highlights and, you know, work on the colors there and then separately work on the blue shadows. Kind right. of. 
Um, I can't wait to go try this on a on an image. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, you know, and, and the thing about it is, you know, even if you pick the wrong mask, you can, you can change it. So let's say, you know, I decided, you know, I really don't want to, you know, and we'll, I don't know, let's, I don't know. Can you throw color onto a gray? I don't think you can. Uh, yeah. I don't. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Let's, uh, can you throw, yeah, I can do hue. Let's do, uh, let's do our curve again. And you can actually just click on these to get a blank layer. So I'm just going to move the, uh, that adjustment up there. Um, so if we made that adjustment here to just kind of like knock this thing out, let's say, you know, so this is this lights three. Right. Um, in fact, I'm going to actually, I'm going to just start from scratch because uh, I want to show the renaming. So if you do a lights three curve, you get the, the curve and it's named it for you. So you, you know, this is lights three. Lumenzi is going to name it. But let's say that, um, you know, I look at this and say, you know, uh, actually I really want to knock out more of the highlights, you know, I, I probably should have used a less restrictive, uh, mask. Yeah. So I could instead go in and take a look at, you know, say maybe, uh, just the lights and I can, um, hit this remask button, which is now, and now you change from lights three, just to lights, I guess, lights one. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and if we went back in the, the history here, um, you know, here was kind of the, or sorry, let's see, we were, uh, we're here's all, where we started. Yeah. Is that it? Um, yeah, so we were, you know, kind of here down to knocking this thing out. Um, so it just, just gives you a lot of flexibility. You know, when you don't necessarily know what to load as a selection, you can use this. And when you, you know, load the wrong mask, you can use the, the remask tool. So um, just trying to keep that workflow pretty, uh, pretty simple. So, if we go back to uh, to our image here, um, and I you know I mentioned you know how would you do the same thing in Lumenzia we did before, right? Um, so I can just simply go and I think we used a, a lights three the first time, and if I just hit remask, it'll drop this down as a mask on this layer. So if I had you know done something in like Nick Color Effects Pro, I can add the mask directly to it. So I've already dropped this down and made that adjustment. And then I can go and I think we had a lights five mask and drop that down here. And, you know, in just kind of four clicks, we did the same thing to, uh, to modify that image. So, you know, ultimately um, there's some, there's definitely some stuff Lumenzia can do that you can't do with a channel based approach. Yeah. But the, uh, you know, first and foremost, it's really about trying to make the workflow easier to understand and faster. That's yeah. That seems so much easier. So much more powerful. Yeah. All right. Do you, did you want to do another image or I don't want to put you on a spot for, um, for anything? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, so. I know we're at the hour, but this is good. I want, I want to, I don't want to set you up for something you're not ready for. So if you're not ready, just let me know, but I'd love to oh, see no. like a, if you have a landscape or something else. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's just do kind of a single image edit here and this is one i've used a few times in some of my uh my youtube videos um and i'll have the link for everybody to, to go to those youtube videos where you, you go in a lot more detail on talking about these things and have a lot of helpful hints and tips that, that you talk about there too yeah so so in this image here you know let's you know, there's a couple of things you might want to do to it um you know one you know maybe i want to get a little more contrast in this you know area down here i find kind of interesting yep and so you, know, you can do that with kind of a, an S curve, but I need to figure out how to, how to apply it down here. So if I just simply uh, use the zone picker, I can just go in here and say, all right, actually maybe I'll select uh, this area in between, um, load up my mask on these little panels down below. And then uh, that was a curve. And then I can just apply an S curve to it. What I like to usually do is use this, uh, targeted adjustment tool where you can go kind of click and drag to so make the light stuff lighter and the dark stuff darker. And that's my S curve. Um, and this is something I do a lot. I'll switch the blend mode to luminosity because when I made this curve, you can see the, uh, the colors um, really aren't flattering, right? As they got right. darker, it really kind of blew out the oranges. So if you change the luminosity, it'll make a, a tonal adjustment, but keep, you know, kind of true to the original colors. Okay. So you can see that the, uh, this got a lot more interesting, but, uh, 
know, there is some kind of, you know, call it collateral damage. If you look up at the, I saw the it, sky change too. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and if I want to avoid that, then you can use essentially a mask on a mask. Yeah. Um, so what you do is you, you load this into a group and you put a mask on it. And so only the parts of the group that show through um, or, or the, the mask on the group would, would control what shows through. So it's sort of like the intersection of the two. So okay. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But the way you do this in Lumenzia is you can just load up the, uh, the standard lasso tool or whatever selection tool you like, but just draw kind of a rough outline on the thing you want to keep and just hit group. And what it's doing is it's doing this mask the mask. Okay. And so now you can see the changes are only yeah, occurring. Yeah, sky didn't change at all. Down here. And, yeah. and this mask is feathered automatically based on the size of the selection. So it's designed to keep it really subtle. So you can see, you know, this is, you know, before we put that group on, all this other stuff was changing. But with the group, it's isolated to just down below. Because, you know, if you think about a luminosity mask, all I'm doing is selecting brightness values. But, you know, these same tones also appear in the, in the, in sky, the sky. Right. And the building. So, you know, I could go in here and take a black mask and, and paint out all this other stuff but that's a lot of work. So it's easier for me to just, you know, put this mask on the mask. Um, and you know, at the end, if I like what's here, um, I don't necessarily need to keep all this. It, it does add to the file size. I've got, you know, 286 megs versus starting at 206. I've added 80 megs to the file. Um, if I want to get rid of that clutter, the ungroup tool basically will collapse these masks. So when I click on this, it's going to take this mask, and apply it to this one. And so, you know, if I'm, I hit, you know, control Z here to kind of go before and after it's the exact same adjustment to the image, Yeah. but now it's only 40 meg instead of 80 or 36 actually, or I guess 34 instead of 80. So the file got smaller and you can see conceptually that, you know, it's basically the intersection of the two masks is this adjustment down here. And I could keep painting this out if I wanted to make it more precise, or whatever, but right. Um, that's where these, this next row here basically lets you kind of refine the masks because usually, um, the starting mask is, is really helpful, but you know, if I adjust the building, you know, maybe the sky is also getting adjusted or whatever, you need to make a little, uh, you know, separation between the two. So that's where you, know, you can use the, uh, the group mask. The, uh, the other option here is called this color group. So let's say we're going to adjust the sky here. So I'd find the, the right selection for that. And I think light three looks pretty good. And you can already see the problem here is that the building is also highly selected because they're both about the same luminosity, even though, you know, obviously the, uh, the colors are totally different. So what you do is we would just load this up as a curve and then uh, I'll make an adjustment here to, uh, you know, bring down the, the sky so we can, you know, see where you're, I don't know how well this comes through on uh, on Google Plus, but I'm seeing it. Yeah, yeah. So the so the sky got a lot better, but the building got kind of Dark, flat and yeah. And so just like we you know masked this mask, we want to put a mask on this one. But the the group tool is all about saying I want this part of the image to be the restriction. The color option is all about saying I want this color, regardless of where it shows up, to be the, the mask essentially. So if I hit color group it's pulling up the color range tool. And, and right now you can't see anything because I haven't clicked, but once I click, it's basically saying, all right, these are the blue parts of the image and I can sort of shift click if I want to add to the selection and I can you know, alt click to, to remove from it. But you can see now that I've got a mask that is basically kind of blue areas yeah. up top here. Um, and you can kind of play with the fuzziness if you want to be more or less specific. Um, you can change the range, which isolates you know, how close it is to the spot where you clicked. You know, so there's you know, some good options to kind of tweak this as you need. But once this looks like, all right, I, I pretty much got the, the sky here. Then I say, okay. And it's going to do the mask, the mask based on the color. So now I've made my adjustment, but it's only in the sky and it's not changing the, uh, the yellow building in the foreground. Oh, that's amazing. Tim, have you ever done that? No, absolutely Me neither. not. Yeah. I need to so go back and re-edit. I'm going to re-watch this so I can figure out how yeah, to I'm do have, it. I'm going to have to re-watch some of this, too, and I'm going to have to buy Lumina, Lum, Luminessa. Did I say that right? 
No. Lamenzia. Lamenzia. Yeah. Lamenzia. Yeah. Yeah. Lamenzia. <laughs> yeah. Lamenzia. And uh, re edit some of my photos. Well, and, and uh, Lumenzia, you know, it comes with uh, a couple hours of tutorial videos. So there's a bunch of there videos that aren't uh, posted on the on my website. They're kind of like a, a private area for, for folks. So there's sort of a, a video manual that goes with it. So I go through all this in, in a lot more detail. Yeah. Um, but that, I mean, that's that's basically the panel. The only the only thing I didn't touch on really is this last row, which is essentially a, a tool to help with dodging and burning, uh, a vignette tool and a sharpening tool. Um, this vignette tool is really cool. Um, you know, I, I always like the, uh, the vignette tool in, uh, Nick color effects pro mm -hmm. where you can, uh, kind of lighten the center and darken the edges. Um, and you know, you can do a, a circular or an oval selection, but, um, it's not too specific. And there's times when, um, you've got something that's a, a really odd shape or it's off center and you want to, you know, do a vignette. Uh, and so what you can do is, you know, kind of like we did with the, uh, the group tool, just use the lasso tool to draw kind of a rough selection over what you want to modify and just hit vignette. And it just automatically vignetted outside of that area. You know, so this is this uh, wow. new layer, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. out here, it's automatically feathered. Um, it's applied a, a curve to it to make an adjustment and it's at a, a moderate opacity. So I can just simply, you know, dial in the opacity to make it as vignetted or as little as I want. But the, the beauty being, you know, it can be any type of vignette you want, off center, weird shapes. Yeah. Um, that is... you, know, you could even uh you could even uh if I step back a couple of steps here, um let's see. You could even do kind of a like a dual zone thing. So I could uh do the selection and if I hit uh shift key, I could do a, do a second, second one. Vignette over here. And when I hit the vignette, now it's going to vignette around both of them. And you kind of see here where, uh, yeah. when I really crank that up, it's, you know, you can, you can do some pretty interesting things that you can't do with a, you know, a typical vignette. That is amazing. So Greg, do you, you shoot a lot of landscape when you go out, do you, um, obviously tripod, are you shooting uh, bracketed? Are you, you know, where if you want to do HDR, you could, uh, are you, what are you doing? Yeah, you know, I I usually um, I usually am shooting brackets. Um, uh, sometimes I shoot two thirds stops, and two thirds for me is when I'm you know I want the flexibility of a bracket, but I'm really kind of hoping I'm going to get it all done in one shot. And yeah. two thirds stops, I can uh, I can pull out the one that's you know pretty much dead on. Um, and if I if I know I'm going to be blending, then I'll shoot at one stop intervals. Um, and whether it's HDR or uh, you know, luminosity, you know, mask blending, uh, same kind of thing, you know, one, one stop intervals. Um, I, you know, I'd say when I'm doing a manual blend with luminosity masks, you can do probably one stop to maybe one and a third stop difference between exposures before usually, you know, if you jump a full two stops or so kind of depends on the image, but usually you're getting to the point where it's, it's just not going to work out in a way that looks nice and natural so I, I usually will will bracket it you know i'd say the uh the exception to that is if i'm doing you know uh, the neutral density stuff with a long exposure i'm probably not going to bracket a five minute exposure yeah. um, you know even if i even if i had the patience for it i'm usually shooting it like sunset and you know by the time that exposure is done that the sun's gone yeah i know you know for me once i started shooting landscape with hdr it's, it became addictive and i didn't want to shoot landscape without hdr do you find now that's the, the case with lumin with uh, luminosity masking that you do this to every landscape uh shot you take every architecture shot or whatever you're taking like that um i i don't have enough time to, to probably do it to every shot you know but the the ones that i post on my website the ones that are most important to me i'm usually going to do you know some advanced editing and, and luminosity masks are are usually a part of that mix you know and i still do hdr yeah um you know sometimes hdr um i find you know if if i barely need to to add in more exposure sometimes hdr is a fast way to bring the image in range and then i'll go and edit it with luminosity masks because the uh, you know the hdr capabilities in photoshop and in lightroom um have the potential to be pretty natural i, I did a demo recently of uh, Lightroom's HDR functionality, right? And I I took some pretty uh, 
probably deserved uh, criticism for making an image that's pretty surreal. Uh, usually when I use HDR in Lightroom, I try and keep it pretty subtle and real. And then I'll use luminosity mask to start picking apart that single image. So, um, you know, in that case, you know, the HDR in, in Lightroom is something I can do in like a minute and, you know, can sometimes save me a lot of time over doing a manual blend. Um, you know, and even when I do a pure HDR, I don't think you can find a, a single shot anywhere I have online where I took something straight out of Photomatics and put it online. It's always a, a mixture of Photomatics as a layer in Photoshop blended with the original images. That's, you know, the key, I think, to having um, you know, HDRs that look real is blend some of the real in with, you know, some of the surreal, you know, from the HDR and, and that's where you get a nice result. So, you know, it, it depends, but I'd say, you know, with my, you know, with, with more, most of my favorite uh, landscapes these days that usually there's, you know, some type of luminosity masking in them now. Would you, would you say if you're, if you're shooting a scene where you have a big dynamic range that you were doing the HDR and then the luminosity masking, where if you had maybe less of a dynamic range, you can just do the luminosity masking? Would that actually, sense? I'd say it's the other way around. Other way around. Um, okay. Yeah. I find that the the bigger the dynamic range, the more, you know, unsatisfying the, the results are out of HDR. Okay. You know, if I only need to add, you know, a couple of stops of range to the HDR, you know, call it, you know, plus or minus one to plus or minus two, then uh, HDR um, can work great. Uh, by the time I get to say plus or minus three, I don't think I've ever seen an HDR image I liked, whether it was out of Photomatics or, you know, Lightroom or Photoshop. It just, I think, is kind of the limit of that approach. Okay. Um, so, so the bigger the dynamic range, the more likely I am to blend it uh, with luminosity masks. If it's... Um, if it's about one stop, sometimes I can get away with just playing with the raw image in Lightroom by carefully playing with kind of the whites and blacks and other adjustments. Um, once it gets a little past that, I'll usually jump to HDR. And then it's usually the, the bigger jumps where I'll switch over to just kind of a pure luminosity masking approach. All right. Um, Tim, any questions? We're we're well past the the 930 timeline there, Greg, but I, you were doing so much interesting stuff. I didn't want to interrupt you. I wanted you to keep going. Oh, I just got to say, I mean, th this is the U S Capitol, right? Or am I totally, uh, I thought that's the, uh, the Texas state Capitol in Austin. Oh, Texas, Cause it looks like the U S Capitol. I'm looking I'm like, I've been there. I don't recall this, this, this part of the Capitol. I'm looking at it. Oh, I guess I'll have to get there. Cause that, this is an amazing picture. Oh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a cool place. You can't see it, but, uh, right behind here, there's like glass, uh, roof for all this underground area. It, it looks like a subterranean city. Um, I didn't walk in there, but it, it just looks like an awesome place. You probably shoot there all day. It's, I, I wish I had to do your traveling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta say, I, I think I'm going to have to go. You, you have video, uh, YouTube videos for this as well. There's going to be a lot of research because some of it, uh, obviously, time constraints doesn't make it easy to go over it. And sure. Lord knows I didn't get much show notes on this. <laughs> right. I mean, we can't go in detail in the show. And, and we'll have links to Greg's uh, tutorials that he does. And if you buy it, like you said, what, how many hours of video do I get, Greg? Uh, a couple hours of uh, free video with it. Couple, yeah, a couple hours of video with it. And then just playing with it, of course, is where you're going to get it. Right. That's knowledge. really how you're going to get it. Yeah. That, I mean, you got to use it to, to learn it. But yeah, it is, it, great, great thing tonight. I got to go back and absorb some of this too. Yes, I think this will be yeah. rewatched quite often. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we streamed some photos tonight. Uh, you can see these photos on Greg's website. A lot of these photos are on your website or your, your 500px. Um, well, don't share me there, Greg. <laughs> sure tim <laughs> yeah that's much better <laughs> oh my shirt does say this is what awesome tim, looks like. it, tim is awesome yes that's what, yeah. that's what it, it, it gets kind of weird i feel like i'm going crazy just looking at photoshop and talking to my computer when i don't see you guys so i was getting lonely yeah i, th <laughs> I think if you hit the stop the stop screen sharing it'll go back to normal there, there we go, go. There oh there it is there we're back to normal <laughs> 
<laughs> but for all the people listening just via video, uh, radio, Mike's shirt says Tim is awesome. It does, and it says this is what awesome looks like. And, and a lot of our <laughs> a lot of our people do get this through audio. So if you're getting this through audio, and I understand I listen to a lot of my podcasts on, on the road too. When you have a chance, you know, head over to our site and watch the video, or over, over to Greg's site and watch his videos or his YouTube channel. You want to see some of the video on this to see what it is. And, you know, we'll have the links to his, to his, uh, Lumen Luminessa. What? No, that's that Lumenzia. wrong? Lumenzia. Uh, I must have picked the wrong name. It's a no, twister. no, it's me. It's a me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have links to all that stuff. <laughs> um, so I have a few things to go over here at the end. Greg, thank you for coming. It's, it's hugely, uh, valuable for me. I need to go back and listen to it again because I didn't get, I didn't absorb everything that you just said. I'm going to have to watch that again and play with it myself to, to get that, understand that. Yes. All right. So if, okay. So if you want to get this show, the best way to get it is by subscribing through Stitcher for audio, Stitcher, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, or Podomatic. Or in all those places. For video, there's really only two places, iTunes and YouTube. It looks like TiVo Tim is shut down podcasting for some reason. Oh, maybe, really? it'll, maybe it'll come back later. So our our guys who are out there watching us on, on TiVo, I don't, you probably won't ever see this because you're watching us through TiVo, but apparently they've shut that down for now. And I've heard from our friend in Romania. I think that's where he's at. Uh, I'm going to mis mispronounce uh, his name, too. Marion, is that, is that the name? Remember me talking about him before? Yeah, Tim? yeah I remember it, but I, I'm not going to pronounce it right because without seeing it, I forget it. He has gone back, and he was one to watch the show from the very beginning, from show number one, and he says, hey, I can't find show number one. Well, show number one through three were audio only, so they're not on YouTube, so I helped him with where those are. And show number four was the first time Tim was on, and that was video. He did say... <laughs> As a guest. <laughs> he, did, <laughs> he did say, Tim... Wow, you've made a lot of progress since the early days. So I guess that's a nice way of saying the early days sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <It's, laughs> anyway, hopefully we improve over time. Uh, we'd love to have you join our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash JPEG Raw. I think that's what it is. We're out there. We have a monthly photo contest and every other week editing contest. I think we're about to put that on pause for the summer. And start that back right. up again in September. But the monthly photo contest goes on every month. Again, this month we're doing an open theme. So your favorite photo that you've taken during the month of June, you can submit it through either the Facebook group or through our website. We have a link there. But we'd love to have you come out there and join us. We also started a beginner's Facebook group. So if you're a beginner, we would love to have you out there. Just search for JP Raw on Facebook, and you'll see several of our groups that you can go join. Um, Greg, I'll have this in show notes, but where can people find you if they want to get in more touch with, in touch with you? Uh, so my website's kind of the hub of everything, just, uh, Greg Ben's photography.com. And if you look down in the footer, I've got links to pretty much, uh, everything else from, from there. Um, I'm on, uh, probably Google plus more than, uh, than, than anything else. Those okay. are pretty good places to find me. And, and for the video stuff, um, it's all linked to my website, um, but uh, YouTube is definitely uh, kind of my hub for, for the videos. Okay. And I, I know you have a link to Twitter also, and, and you have photos up on 500px too. All of those are links on your website. We'll have those links too. Um, if you have a suggestion for a guest, not you, Greg, or if you do have one, Greg, that'd be great too. Gordon gave us a great suggestion, which was Greg for tonight. If you have a suggestion for a guest or just comments on how Tim and I can improve or how much show number one through three sucked. Um, <laughs> you can send us your comments at podcast at jpdraw.com. That's the best way to get in touch with Tim or I. And we'd love to have you out in the forums, which is, I, I'll put these links up here so people can see them while I was talking, which is jpdraw.com slash forums. Uh, I am out there posting. We have some other people posting. And the forums actually have a blog section. And that blog section could be almost anything where you don't want anything, um, what do you, call it? Uh, you know, abusive or, uh, you know, probably not political or anything like that. But it, it doesn't have to be photography related. I've started one on I'm trying to eat better and exercise. We'll see how long that lasts. But I'm doing a, I'm doing a post out there 
about probably about every week. Not going to do them every day. That's just crazy. But post out there where you can see that. And if you want to start your own, if you don't have your own website and you want to start one, you can do that. It's a nice feature of the forums where you can go and start your own little blog or more than one if you want. And you don't have another place to do it. Also, always remember, if you're going to go to Amazon and purchase anything out there, it doesn't have to be photography related, use our link. We get a small credit, uh, jpegderaw.com slash Amazon. And we use those funds to do giveaways and stuff like that. We just gave away a couple weeks ago, we gave away the Lightroom and Photoshop one year prepaid subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud photography plan. We, I mailed that out the other day to our winner. So it's the, you using our link at Amazon helps us pay for those things. So the, the more you do, the more we'll give away. As Tim and I are not in this for the money. Yeah, I, I'm still waiting for my first check. Yeah, that's not, not, not coming. Not coming. <laughs> oh, well. Yep. Yeah. So until next week, when uh, next week, I think we're talking about Lightroom. Until next week, keep it raw. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks for having me.